Today I'm going to talk to you about emergence and reductionism from the point of view of a physicist who's working on complex systems. The reason I've allowed myself to talk about such philosophical concepts is because I think I can provide a simple example which can clarify some of the contradictions that may exist in these two concepts. So let me start from the concept of reductionism. What is reductionism? Reductionism can essentially be viewed from two points of view. One from a practical point of view, another one from a philosophical point of view. A practical point of view is a tool that's used in physics and science in general, which says that if you want to understand a complex system, you reduce it in, into its parts and the interaction between its parts. This is a tool that actually is very useful and used by physicists all the time. Another view of reductionism is somewhat of a philosophical point of view where it says everything that's observable in the universe is essentially reducible to elementary particles and their interactions. In other words, the rest is details. So these two things, these two concepts can sometimes be misunderstood. Because on the other side, in complex systems, there's something called emergence. What emergence is, is that essentially there is a behavior in a complex system as a whole, which is more than the sum of its parts. So if we pay close attention to these two concepts, it could be viewed that these two concepts of emergence and reductionism are in contradiction. What I want to tell you is that this contradiction is not really true. The main reason for such a claim is that there's always complicated interactions between elements of the com complex system. In a sense, what makes a complex system complex is the interaction between its individual parts. So how is it that interaction between individual parts can lead to emergent properties? For one thing, one can think of the concept of practicality versus principle. So despite the fact that we believe everything in principle is reducible to interactions and individual parts, it's not possible to understand this because there's complicated interactions which we do not understand. For example, think about a society. A society consists of individual people and the interaction between them. We don't know the interaction between individual people in a society. Therefore, we think there is emergent properties which are not reducible to individual people. On the other hand, there could be statistical laws. For example, we need to see an emergent property as a property where there's more and more events occurring. It cannot be seen in one individual part because the statistical laws are seen as a whole when there's enough evidence. Another reason could be self-organization. There's a concept in complex systems where systems who are behaving randomly can spontaneously self-organize to a collective behavior. Another reason is symmetry breaking. Symmetry breaking and phase transition is a very important concept in statistical physics. Essentially, complex systems can exist in different phases despite the fact that the underlying dynamics is the same between the two phases. The reason phase transitions occur is because of symmetry breaking. So symmetry breaking is an underlying principle which can describe how different phases can exist within one system. So in order to bring an example which can describe how these concepts can happen within a complex system, I want to talk to you about a complex network. In complex networks, what we think about is normally a set of nodes and links that connect the nodes. So it's a mathematical object which is very easy to study and is very relevant to many, many complex systems. So when we model a complex network, the best and easiest and most 
frequent way to think of, about a complex network is to think of a set of nodes that are connected randomly to each other. This is called an Erdos-Renier network or a homogeneous network. One of the ways to characterize networks is to study what's called degree distribution. A degree of a node is the number of connections a node has. In a homogeneous network, what happens is that the probability distribution of the degree of the network is a homogeneous function. In other words, it has a peak and a quickly decaying function, which means that there's a lot of behavior in the network, which is the average behavior. And if you deviate from the average behavior, the probability of seeing nodes decays very quickly to zero. In other words, the behavior of the network is easily understood in terms of the behavior of the average, because the average is very frequent and very probable. Now, one might think that they can take this concept of homogeneous network and try to transfer it to various other networks that actually happen in reality. For example, a network of neurons, in other words, the brain, or a network of social interactions like the Instagram or Facebook, or a network of uh, economic agents. When we do this, we realize that the actual networks are not consistent with the model we just made. The reason is that in actual networks, like the brain network or the social network on Instagram, are consistent of many, many nodes that have very few connections or low degree and very few nodes that have a high degree. In other words, the real networks are heterogeneous. In heterogeneous networks, the behavior of the collective network is dominated by what are called hubs. A hub is a node which is highly connected to the network. The behavior of the network, again, is dictated by the behavior of the hub. For example, if you want to spread information or let's say a virus in a network, what you have to do is infect the hub, which is very easy to infect because it's connected to almost everybody. And once it gets infected, then it can infect almost the entire network very quickly. In other words, the information transfer is optimized in a scale-free heterogeneous network. Another interesting property of such networks is robustness. So if you attack the network and start removing the nodes from a scale-free network, the whole of the network keeps its connectivity and can function despite the fact that a large part of the network has been removed. These two properties are not true when we view the homogeneous networks. In other words, when you want to spread information in a homogeneous network, you have to do this node by node. So it takes a long time compared to a heterogeneous network to transfer the information. So the optimized transfer of information and the concept of robustness are emergent properties of scale-free networks cannot, that cannot be reduced to its individual parts. So what's the key concept here? Has something strange happened? The answer is no. The distinction between a heterogeneous network and a homogeneous network is what is called preferential attachment. A preferential attachment is a statistical law that tells how incoming new members into a network attach to existing members of the network. Preferential attachment is a statistical law that describes how a new agent that joins a network interacts with other agents. Imagine you join Instagram. When you join Instagram, you interact with people you know around you. But every now and then, you have a tendency to attach or follow individuals in the network that are highly connected. For example, you might want to follow Cristiano Ronaldo if you like football. 
This preferential attachment is a statistical law which, when applied frequently, leads to an emergent property of scale-free networks. It's the law that dictates how scale-free networks emerge. So, the key concept I've tried to explain is that scale-free networks have emergent properties such as robustness and optimal information transfer that other networks do not have. This is true despite the fact that all the properties of the network can be reduced to the nodes and the interaction between the nodes. In other words, reductionism holds. Thank you very much.